Hey, y'all. Out of all the fun, amazing things going on here today, thank you for coming to my room and uh, listening to what I got to say. I am a senior security consultant uh, with about 14 years of experience, um, locally trained in Oklahoma. Uh, recently got my CISP. If anyone wants to talk about study materials, those are fresh on my brain. Most of my experience does come from public sector, where I spent about a decade working in Oklahoma state government. My last role before joining the consultancy side, I was the CIO for the State Department of Education. I'm also a co-founder of B-Sides Oklahoma and a founding member of Techlahoma, which is a nonprofit in the state of Oklahoma, bringing different technologists together. B-Sides Oklahoma, 10 years strong, y'all! Woo! Year 11 is next year. Come on out and see us in April. We've got a great con. Um, I work at Go Security Pro. Here's some of the things that we're good at. They're helping cover my travel. Check us out if you're interested. So today, y'all, we are going to talk about trust. Being trusted, trusting others. This is a massive topic that could easily be a two-day training session. One day I might turn this into a workshop. It'll be really, really fun. Um, but my hope is that by the end of this talk, you're going to understand some different types of trust and how to establish it quickly with others, keeping in mind all things security, we got black hat, we got white hat. There's going to be good reasons to establish trust with others the same way as there are black hat reasons. So please, please, please let this be an experience where you let your mind wander to all of those evil genius scenarios for how you can bend trust to your advantage. So we're going to start with some basic terms. Trust and psychological safety. These are two different things. And it's important to understand the difference between these terms. Trust is individual. How do I trust you? How do you trust me? Psychological safety is a group phenomenon. It's something that we see in maybe your ISSA chapter, maybe your workplace, maybe if you're on a soccer team or a sports team. How do you act differently in that group? If you're part of that group, are they going to look at you weird if you didn't share your ideas? Or are, are they going to look at you weird if you share your ideas and innovation? Do you feel that you're in an entrusted environment in certain places that you can take risks and bring up things in a safe space? So our types of trust. We got cognitive trust. We have effective trust. Short version. Bob has his CISP and 20 years of experience. I can trust him on this project. That's cognitive trust. Effective trust. Bob's got a nice smile. He kind of looks like my cousin. I think I can trust him. When I gave you guys my intro credentials, I attempted to establish trust with you. You should trust me because I have this background. When I gave you the talk agenda, I set the groundwork for consistency. Am I actually going to follow my talk's agenda? We're going to roll a D20 and see about it, y'all. But that was my goal. I'm going to establish trust with you. Here's how I'm capable. Here's how I can be consistent. Most of us here probably rely on cognitive trust in our day-to-day -day jobs. Do our end users, our constituents, our clients, do they trust us to build, maintain, deploy their systems? But at the same time, do they have effective trust with you? When you push out changes on Patch Tuesday, it's like, oh man, the system's going to be broken again. It's that time of month. It's going to happen. Or if you're able to maintain your systems in a productive environment, do people begin to not only think that you're capable, but you care about the business. And because you maintain their systems, you care about their mission, their mission statement and how it actually affects the business. Because at the end of the day, security is there to facilitate the business and protect it. If the business isn't running, we ain't got nothing to protect. So another thing is with the cognitive trust, think about if you had an entry level position open. What if the candidate that hires and starts their first day is a 60-year-old pensioner? What if that new hire is a 20-year-old? Both could be fresh out of college, one switching careers, one starting their new one. What types of inherent different types of trust would you have in each of those people? What types of capabilities or consistencies would you expect from them? Moving on to effective trust. Humans are nationally, naturally emotional creatures. We have a lot of chemicals that affect our emotions. Effective trust is trust of the heart. It's empathy. It's trusting in someone's capacity for caring. It's less of a science because what inspires me to trust is going to be different from everyone else in this room. But there are some core principles 
in human psychology that are standardized across the board. Um, but you know, that change managers example, how does different things affect your trust that you have in your organization? Do people, do you, can you reach that true trusted advisor estate if they trust that you're capable and they also trust that you care? Combining the two different trusts together can have huge impacts on your goals, just depending on what you're wanting to do. And if you're in a client relationship or you're in social ops, you can use different tactics for short-term or long-term trust. It's like, okay, Carrie, that's great. Different types of trust. Why should we bother? The answer is we can't help it. From birth, we are hardwired to form bonds with people. We are dependent upon others to take care of us. It is hard coded in us. And when I first started writing this, I'm like, I really want to connect with people. I'm a huge introvert. So like after today, I'm going to go back to my room and like no one talk to me. I'm going to be completely drained, but I love this interaction. And it's because we want to connect. It is there. Um, but what can we do with trust? It can help you go from an interview to a job offer. How hard is it just to get that first interview? Then are you going to squander it? Are you going to waste it? How quickly can you help that hiring committee know you can trust me? Not only am I capable, but I'm going to care about your business. Can it increase innovation among your staff? You build that trusted environment among your staff. Do they begin to feel psychological safety that they can bring forth innovative ideas and they'll take risks in the environment that'll improve and increase automation, increase efficiencies across the board? Um, it's also gonna help you complete role specific tasks and jobs. Um, clients trusting sales staff. Sales staff can completely uh, establish trust. They're going to sell more stuff long term. They're going to upsell. Uh, social operators getting ring con data and exe getting executive leadership support of your projects. So let's look at some tactics. Effective trust tactics or how to manipulate. Uh, we're going to go through some nonverb or verbal. Oh. One of my favorite things up here is can you help me? With, with vishing pretenses, call on the phone, start your conversation. Can you help me? I've been getting the runaround. I've been transferred so many different places. Every single person in this room, every single person that you might call has had that experience. They don't want to be the cause of that experience. You're going to invoke guilt. You're going to invoke empathy in that person that answered the phone on the other line. Can you help me? Is the strongest phrase that you can use starting a vishing pretense. Um, the other thing is like if that person doesn't respond, hang up, call back. Try again till you get the right rep who does respond to your pretense. Um, if you have staff, what are your plans for the weekend or holiday? This is something that you should not use casually. If you're using this, like, because you know you're getting ready to ask somebody to work overtime or work over the weekend, nah. This isn't how you're going to get someone to trust you. This is something that you need to do long term. Show interest in your staff outside of the workplace. Um, mirror communication styles, for the love of God, if you ever meet William Shatner, please do not mirror his communication style. But when you're talking to your leadership or you're talking to people, their cadence, their inflictions, how they talk, your physical presence, like this is a superhero pose and like shoulders up, back, like military marching band people here, you know that stance. Um, all of those things convey, and I'm gonna touch on that more on nonverbal, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but the other piece is an honest story. Have you gone through some type of incident response that's similar to your client or the person you're talking to? Even if it's not your story, can you tell a story you know as yours, black hat, white hat, remember, and invoke empathy? And that person's be like, oh, that person gets me. And people don't remember most of what you say when you meet them, they remember how you made them feel. So how can you make people feel a way that when they think about you after meeting you for those five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, that you made them feel respected, valued in a way that you bring in effective trust, that you care about them? Uh, Nonverbals. These are things that are going to be pretty standard interview tips. Eye contact. You're interested in someone. Genuine smiles. Don't try to do creepy smiles if you're on social ops and you can't do it, please, y'all. It is, you are going to make it hard for yourself. Look in the mirror. Practice your stuff. Know what works for you. Um, something else, lean in when a person is speaking. Uh, this works really great at conference rooms and tables. You are naturally drawn physically to the things you're interested in. So let that body language reflect it, whether you mean it or not. Let that person think you're really interested in what they're saying. Um, other things, handwritten notes. Uh, I'm from Oklahoma and in the South, when we love people, we feed them. 
it makes them content and they're happy. My three-year-old says, Mama, if, it, if that person's cranky, I think they need a snack and a nap. And damn right, baby girl, anybody that's angry, give them a snack and a nap and they're going to be better. Um, if you're in sales, point out you're doing something special. Maybe you've got leeway grace to give somebody a 10%, a 15% discount. That client doesn't need to know that. Hey, you know, you're so special. I really enjoyed talking to you. I think we can work this in for you. Tell that little why lie. Why are those effective trust tactics? Oh, I'm so special. They're doing something special for me. Um, also, own your own mistakes and apologize. If integrity is huge for me, and in any environment, I believe that if you can't establish and maintain your integrity, you're not going to be successful. If you make a mistake, like CrowdStrike, come out and apologize for it. Y'all own it. I'm not going to speak to the things that are going on with a threatening legal suit, but I like that they publicly apologize and own their mistake. Um, so, you know, own it up. Don't try to make excuses. Explain your validations, but let people know, especially your leadership, you mess up, own it. I messed up. Here's how I messed up. Here's how I'm going to make sure it's not going to happen again. If you lose integrity, reestablish it immediately. Cognitive trust or how to manipulate it. Verbal, y'all, be yourself. And remember, this is capability and consistency, how capable you are and are you consistent. And being yourself sounds lame. It sounds like I'm throwing a kitten poster meme at you, but it really means being introspective and being open about your capabilities. Where are you strong? Where are you weak? This is how teams excel. If your teams are honest about where you're strong and where you're weak, you're going to come together and you're going to lean on each other to create a better product and a better deliverable. Um, you know, and it's, Everybody hates the interview question, what's your greatest strength? What's your greatest weakness? Everyone hates the, I'm a perfectionist. Be real. Like, I got audio issues, man. I'll zone in on a project and somebody can be standing next to me talking and I will not hear you. Um, be cognizant of your tone of voice and your inflictions. I'm a natural pessimist. I'm sure everyone here is full of skepticism and stuff too and it carries through in your voice. If you have problems at work and you're talking to executive leadership, that pessimism might come through. Your concern might come through. And they're going to feel your words before they hear the meaning. Be cognizant of how you talk. And even the, the trick, the mind, the, men, the mental model that works for me is instead of being concerned about the problem, stay focused on the positivity that we have a solution. We may not have a remediate, full remediation plan yet, but we have a remediation plan. Um, and let them feel the positivity of explaining the solution. Uh, Nonverbal, again, make eye contact. Dress for the part I absolutely hate, but it is one of the easiest ways that you can influence how people think that you may be capable. If state capital in any state in the United States, I better go in in business formal. But if I go to Silicon Valley for an executive leadership and I have to show up in a three-piece suit, I'm going to get laughed out the door. Goodwill is a treasure trove for social operators. Go in, get yourself a FedEx, FedEx or a UPS logo, walk into a place with an empty box and a clipboard and just see how far you can go. Walk in like you own the place and you know exactly where that delivery is going. Nine times out of 10, you're going to get straight past that checkpoint. Um, facial expressions. I'm also terrible about resting bitch face. Um, so uh, be cognizant, y'all. Uh, I'm not saying you got to know how to play poker and win in Vegas, but, you know, keep that in mind. Um, for long-term trust, I mean, again, y'all, integrity. Take action. If you said you were going to do something, do it. If it's something as simple as you're passing someone in the hallway or they send you a Teams message and say, hey, I, hey I'm, I'm really busy, I'll follow up with you later. Next thing you know, it's almost quitting time and you still haven't followed up with that person. Shoot them a quick email, send them a message. Hey, the day got away from me. I'm really sorry. Own your mistake. Apologize right off the bat. But I'm going to come see you first thing in the morning. Or hey, can I get 10 minutes on your calendar? I'm so sorry. We're going to fix this. Address it. Be on time. I'm also perpetually late. I'm telling you guys to practice what I preach, not what I do. <laughs> so coming on time to certain things, being prepared. Um, and then reverse engineering what others needs. That sounds really sexy and cool, but that's really just being a good human and being good to yourself. Stop and think about what someone else needs. Your projects aren't getting funded. How are you presenting them? You got another department, their shit is getting funded. Go talk to them. How are you presenting your stuff? Go talk to the chief of staff, talk to the CFO. What did you like about theirs, but you didn't like about mine? 
Any new IT director, CIO, best advice I can give you, make friends with the CFO. They're going to fund your stuff. Granted, they don't want cybersecurity fallouts as much as you do. Same thing if you've got a separate procurement officer. Um, also, um, your HR. Make friends with HR. Um, we're going to make rules for security, but HR is going to enforce them. Um, so when you think about reverse engineering what others need, whether it's in an enterprise environment, a workplace, or social operations or sales, think about what those people need and how can you change your delivery to focus on how your solution fits their needs, furthers the, the business mission statement, whatever that section is, lowers a budget, saves money, um, gets the information that you need, makes them feel a certain way. There's a lot of... Um, phishing engineering tactics going on where malicious actors are establishing care with people. They're going through long series of text messages and different on messaging platforms, establishing friendships with people and eventually getting them to send them money. Reverse engineer what people need. Take that, how many different layers can you take that to places to be more successful in your endeavors? So one of the last thoughts that I want to leave you guys with is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we think, why bother with trust? It fulfills a need. Whether it's your staff, your engineers, your targets, your victims, they have needs that they need to have fulfilled. So it's a human condition to want to connect with others. Using these tactics are gonna take practice. Some of them you might be really good at, you're naturally good at. Other ones you might have to work on. But if you use some of these tactics to make sure your boss knows and trusts in your capabilities, could you get a raise or a promotion within the next year? If you start a security awareness campaign at work, does it become more successful because the end users don't just trust that you're capable of safeguarding their systems, they trust that you care about them? Can you throw in little tidbits to your security training that it's not just about safety and security at work, but it's their iPhone, it's their home computer. I care about you, not just you at the business. Will they actually start reporting suspicious activities? I mean, granted, we all don't want 100 emails saying, we got this phishing campaign, please stop telling us we know we got hit. But they'll start telling you things. Maybe it's, maybe it's we got this business process and we've been sending this shit an email. Wait, what? And you know you have encrypted email, right? So how can we get in depth embedded into business process and secure everything? Um, it's also, it could change the dynamics of your team. If everyone felt trusted or psychologically safe enough to bring up ideas, what would happen? Um, I made um, my team, everyone had to have a side project. And I didn't care if they made progress on it, but it was part of their performance evaluation. You had to have a project and make some type of effort towards it. I get it if you're busy, whatever, but make some type of progress towards it. And I had database developers come in my office one day and they were so excited. Carrie, we just found a place where we can automate a thing that takes us 15 minutes a week. Okay, show it to me. And they didn't think it was that big of a deal. And they're like, yeah, we're going to automate this, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, do y'all know what you've done? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, no, you just saved yourself 15 minutes a week. Multiply that over a year. I was able to take that information to the CFO and get those database developers a raise. As you do the math on their salary, and they saved 15 minutes a week. Take that information. Take it back into the business. Show your staff that you care and you appreciate their efforts. And what will they do to make your business better? So one quote, um, I'd like to challenge you guys. Anybody can go hack a system, but can you hack a person? Besides Black Hat Vegas. Challenge all of you guys, hack a person while you're here, not just a system. Um, if anyone wants to connect, uh, here's my information as well as my company information. Uh, I'd love to hear from you guys or if you guys would like a copy of the slide, if you want to know more from me, I've got some business cards up here and I've got some stickers. Um, do I have any questions from the crowd? Anybody want to share something they learned or uh, a new evil insight that's, yeah, I'm going to go hack a person doing this. Keep your secrets. Don't, don't share them with anyone. Keep your tactics to yourself. Don't be like me. Don't share your tactics. All right. Thank you, guys. You've been lovely.